Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar this morning. Um, I hope you are all well and had a lovely Heritage Day yesterday. Just by a show of hands, can I confirm that everybody, one, can see the um, presentation, and two, that you can hear me. If you could just, oh, thank you so much. That's great. Okay, so um, welcome to the webinar this morning. This is a webinar that I've done a number of times. Um, and I'm sure that many people are attending today as we go into the employment equity, let's call it season. Um, so I'm going to be going through the same things that I would normally do, which is one is to explain the purpose of the Employment Equity Act, so the various different elements in terms of um, what is required. Um, of the Act, and then also the process that is needed in terms of meeting compliance. Um, before I go into that, though, what I do want to do is to give a little bit of feedback from the most recent uh, road shows that we attended. Uh, the one that was done in Durban, <clears throat> we attended recently, but there are also other road shows that are happening around the country. Um, and just to give a little bit of feedback from that perspective, uh, and, you know, just so that you can understand what is expected, or at least what the Department of Labor are expecting from employers. So the first thing that is very key is one that the uh, the legislation that was meant to be changing. So there was legislation they've been talking about for a few years which was the removal of the uh, turnover. So uh, currently, as it stands, is anybody who has less than 50 employees, but their turnover exceeds um, exceeds the amount that is given. Sorry, there's just a question regarding the slides. Um, can everybody see the slides other than the one person? Yeah, I'm still on the first slide, so I haven't gone past anything. Just by thumbs up, can everyone else see the slides? Um, okay, thanks, Davina. All right, thanks, uh, Corin. Okay, so as I move through, I'll just let you know, if you're unable to see the slides, then maybe exit the meeting and then rejoin. So I haven't moved past the first slide yet. I'm just, uh, perfect. Um, okay, so basically in terms of the, 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 the roadshow, for those of you who haven't attended, the legislation has not yet changed. And so anybody who is less than 50 employees, but their turnover exceeds that, uh, that is listed in Schedule 4 um, of the, that is listed in Schedule 4, you are still required to submit. The other thing that came out, <clears throat> which is something that um, I noted last year, is that many people who become non-designated for whatever reason, i.e. the company closes or their turnover goes below a certain amount and or they have now less than 50 employees, what they don't do is they don't deregister. So as it stands at the moment, if you are no longer designated, you have a requirement to um, apply for deregistration, and that application runs from the 1st of April to the 31st of August. If you have not deregistered, you are still required to submit, um, even if the company has closed. So if you don't do that, they can still uh, inverted commas, you know, it's a bit weird if the company is closed, but they can still come after you if you're not designated anymore, you are still required to submit. So if you're no longer designated and you haven't applied for deregistration, you do need to submit this year, even if it's a case of submitting, doing what you need to do, and then come 1st of April next year is applying for the, excuse me, the deregistration. So if they are not aware that you're no longer designated, then that is my recommendation because they will come and do an audit or they can come and do an audit and then issue you with a fine. I do know that that has happened. It happened previously with um, somebody that we work with. There was a company that had closed down. They didn't do the deregistration because the company didn't exist and they were issued with a fine. Okay. So that's the one thing. The other thing at the moment is that the legislation has not changed. So everything, as we know, it remains the same. Uh, the, 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 the big push that they're having at the moment is obviously they want in transformation. So they are doing audits and they are actively looking at what your employment equity plan is saying. So the key takeaways is they do not want people to just be doing equity for the sake of doing equity. There must be an active um, 
uh, you know, push towards transformation. So there is a very big push towards looking at the EAP <clears throat> and looking at your numbers aligned with the EAP. The sector targets do not stand at the moment because the legislation has not changed. And so you are required to work towards the EAP. Okay. Those are all given to you in the most recent um, report from the Department of Labor. So if you go onto their, their website or just search for the latest um, uh, Employment Equity Commission report, inside that report, they will give you the EAP for all the different regions um, as well as the national EAP. So you need to look at your business in terms of national as well as whatever region you're in. Um, you know, if you're mostly national, then it would obviously only be national. But if you're KZN based as well as national, then you must look at both. Another key takeaway is that you have to use, although this shouldn't really be said any longer, you have to use the documentation that is given to you by the Department of Labor. Don't try and create another employment equity plan that is not on the format given to you by the Department of Labor because that will not be accepted. Okay. So those are some of the key takeaways. Um, they are just from my side, we've noticed this, they are doing a lot of audits at the moment. So they're doing many, many, many different audits in a lot of different regions. So it's not in K, it's not just in KZN. We have many clients that are being audited. So please ensure as we go through the webinar, you, you're taking notes of the things that you need to have in place. Um, you know, some of the key things, for example, is the employment equity meetings. Uh, you can't just have a meeting once. You need to be having meetings. You need to make sure that your, your ducks are in a row because when they come and do an audit, they don't give you a lot of time to, to give the documentation and they are looking at it and they're going through the stuff. Okay. All right, so that's just some feedback from the most recent roadshow. If you do have an opportunity to go, it would be my recommendation to do so, um, just so that you can have a first-hand uh, uh, view of what they're presenting and what it is that they're looking for. Okay, all righty. So first things first, what I am going to do, which I do in all my webinars in, in terms of employment equity, is just to give a basic overview of why we're doing employment equity in the first place. Um, and this is important so that you can understand, um, you know, so it's not just about the forms, there is something that's greater. Okay. So when we look at the Employment Equity Act, it was developed uh, to promote firstly equal opportunity and fair treatment uh, of all employees through the elimination of unfair discrimination. So there are two elements to the Act. The first is the elimination of unfair discrimination, which applies to all employers in South Africa. So regardless of whether you're designated or you're not, there is an expectation for every single employer to eliminate unfair discrimination. Okay. Uh, then the second element, which really only applies to designated employers, okay, which is anybody over 50 employees, as well as those that are under 50 but have a turnover greater than that in Schedule 4, which is basically the implementation of affirmative action measures to, um, to ensure that your uh, anything within your business that is creating a barrier to employment equity is fixed. Now, often people get this element wrong when they look at affirmative action and they understand the words of affirmative action. Everybody, everybody understands it to mean one particular thing. Um, and so when they apply it in their business, what they do is they apply their understanding of affirmative action, which generally is not correct because they will go and apply to a particular group from a country perspective. So we are only going to, for argument's sake, focus on African females with disabilities, or we're only going to focus on women, or we're only going to whatever it may be. So when you're applying affirmative action in your business, what you will do is you then take your understanding of affirmative action and you apply that logic, okay, uh, which is actually not correct. So affirmative action, when you're applying it, um, applies specifically to the barriers to employment equity in your business. So as an example, if in my business, I do not have sufficient, let's for argument's sake, say people with disabilities, and just for the purpose of this conversation, we will assume it's somebody 
who is in a wheelchair. Let's assume my business only has stairs. And so if I then, um, you know, put out an advert and somebody in a wheelchair comes for an interview, let's assume it's online for the purpose of this. Um, and they're wonderful. They're so great. And so I give them the job. And then they arrive the first day to the job and they can't get into the building. There are no facilities for them. They can't even get to their office. Now, that is a barrier to employment equity in this particular. So for me and my business, that is a barrier because it doesn't matter how hard I try and who I get to try and come for a job. They won't be able to do the job because my workplace doesn't allow it. So an affirmative action measure in that particular scenario might be making changes to my workplace so that that person could get a job and so I could achieve and promote equity in that particular group. Another example might be that in my particular workplace, maybe I don't have enough, I don't know, let's say um, Indian females. Okay, so when I start to look at why do I not have enough Indian females, it might be that they, um, you know, they don't go into my particular field or I don't know, whatever it may be. And so when I look at the EAP and I establish why do I not have what the EAP is? What is the barrier to employment equity? Any measure that I put in place to try and rectify that barrier is my affirmative action me measure. So as you can see is that if you start to implement affirmative action as a countrywide thing, so you just go, it's all African females, or it's all, I don't know, women, or it's all whatever, your workplace may not have that issue. So you may have a workplace that has actually got mostly women, and men are underrepresented. And so applying a countrywide logic to um, affirmative action isn't going to help you, because all that's going to happen is you're going to then get more females, which then doesn't align to, to your EAP, which means that you're not doing what you need to do. So when you're looking at your, your numbers and that sort of thing, you take your numbers, you compare it to your EAP, and you start to establish why you're either over or underrepresented in certain things, and then put measures in place relating to those particular challenges that you are having in your particular workplace. It is not the same as we go through. Okay. All right, so hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Okay, then we have a look at the different elements. So as I said in the slide before, the first element of employment equity, which applies to everybody, is the elimination of unfair discrimination. That applies to everyone, okay, regardless of how large or small you are. And there are five elements of unfair discrimination. Okay, so the Employment Equity Act defines for us what that is. The first section, which we refer to as section 6.1, is sort of the cornerstone which says that no person may unfairly discriminate, either directly or indirectly, against an employee in any employment policy or practice on one or more of those grounds. Okay. Now, the key aspect here is just understanding that you can have both fair as well as unfair discrimination. So by, by the, the, the word discrimination is everybody assumes that it is automatically unfair, which is not the case. So the purpose of employment equity in this particular aspect is to try and ensure that what we are not doing is as a person walks in, we go up. Oh, it's a woman, and we know that women can't do this job because of whatever, um, that we automatically exclude them. Or we decide for argument's sake that just because somebody, I don't know, is too old, too young, too uh, pregnant, or whatever it is, that they can't do the job, we cannot have a policy or a practice that automatically excludes someone. Okay, so that's the first thing. Remembering that we can have fair discrimination. So, for example, you could have fair discrimination in terms of age. If you have a retirement policy within your business that says that everybody must retire at age 65, if somebody is age 70 and you don't want to employ them because they're over retirement age, that would be fair discrimination. Okay, you can also have various other things where you can say based on this and this and this, it is fair or unfair. So, for example, if you needed a driver's license to do your job, it is fair discrimination to exclude the person. If we look at anything in this slide, however, be very careful of having a policy that specifically excludes people based on this. So a good one that often comes up is that we don't employ people who have young families because, or we don't employ mothers 
uh, who have young families because they can't work overtime, et cetera, et cetera. That is, you're going to struggle to get past that one. Another good one that often comes up is the pregnancy thing, um, especially when someone comes for an interview and they are, um, they don't tell you that they're pregnant. They're not required to tell you that they're pregnant. Um, and you also can't exclude anybody because um, of their pregnancy. So just be very careful of those things. Okay. So one thing as we go through is just to understand that in terms of the definition of an employee is for employment equity purposes is that um, an employee, and this is quite important from a harassment perspective as well, is an employee is anybody, including applicants for employment, as well as volunteers who assist in carrying on or conducting the business of an employer. Okay. Now, it's quite important that you understand that because very often, sorry, just going back a second, this is different to the definition in basic conditions. It's also a little bit different if you look at possibly the definition when we're looking at a tax perspective. It could be different um, in terms of labor relations. So it's quite important that you understand that when we look at, at looking at any policy um, from an employment equity perspective, this is what we're looking at. And this element over here in terms of volunteers, Okay, this is very key when we're looking at the Code of Good Practice on Harassment because um, it does include volunteers. Okay, so <clears throat> any policy and practice when we're looking at unfair discrimination on race, gender, sex, includes somebody who is applying for a job. So if I don't get a job that I've applied for, I can refer the matter to CCMA. Um, and say, so I think that I was excluded or discriminated because I am X, Y, Z. So on one of those following grounds, that's why I was excluded. So just understand that this definition is slightly different. Okay. Then the second element of um, uh, unfair discrimination, remembering that these are all the things that when you're looking at your barriers to employment equity and that kind of thing. The reason I'm telling you these things is because this is really what they're going to be looking for. This is what you need to try and eliminate. So the second element <clears throat> which came into, uh, came into effect, I think in 2019, was the concept of equal pay for equal work. Okay. Everybody, everybody got very excited about this because we were all going to earn exactly the same amount of money. Uh, but that is not the case. So basically what this says is that you cannot have a difference in any term and condition of employment, which is not just remuneration, it's any term and condition of employment for employees of the same employer who do same or substantially the same work or work of equal value that is directly linked to one of the grounds in section 6.1. Okay, so in essence, what it is saying is that you can have a difference in terms and conditions, but 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 you can't have the reason for that difference based on something in section 6.1. And this actually came into effect because what they discovered was after many, many years of having employment equity is there was still quite a big difference between the pay for men who were doing one job and women doing the same job. The, dis the discrepancies were still quite large. And so what they're saying is that if you look at your remuneration of people within your workplace, and you have two people doing the same job and there is a difference, remembering it's not just about money, that's where everybody goes, but if there is a difference, the question that you as the employer need to ask is why is there a difference, okay? If that difference is anything relating to anything on here, so i.e. I pay men more or, I don't know, I pay this group more or I give this group a, um, a benefit that I don't give that group, remembering we're talking about people on the same level, so when we're looking at it, we go, why are we giving this group more than that group? Then we need to ask the question. If you do, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do have um, a difference in terms and conditions that is unexplained, then the requirement, and you can look at the code of good practice on this, the requirement is, is that you have a look at why you have those differences. If you don't know why you have the differences, then you need to put in place a plan to rectify those differences. It doesn't say that it has to happen immediately, but you need to identify what the differences are and then try and fix it going forward. So it does acknowledge that in the past, there might have been uh, policies that were incorrect. Um, your obligation is just to fix it. There is also not an obligation that you need to necessarily share all this information with everybody. 
you just need to have a look and put in place a plan. Okay. Alrighty. Then the third element of unfair discrimination is harassment. Okay. So in terms of harassment, um, I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but just to understand that in terms of harassment here, there is a code of good practice um, that everybody needs to go through. There is, and the code of good practice that used to be only on sexual harassment. Okay. It is now not just on sexual harassment. It is on harassment of all forms. So there are three different types of harassment, which I'm not necessarily going to go through all of them, but the, the obligation of an employer to ensure that you don't have harassment in your workplace is much greater now. So it's not just a case of having a policy. It is much broader than that. Remembering that as we go forward into the new legislation, if you have a CCMA case against you and which it has been found that you as the employer did not deal with harassment correctly, you will get a, a finding against you, which will then prohibit you from getting your certificate for employment equity. Okay. So they are looking at harassment in a much greater, um, you know, the, the focus is on it now far more than it used to be before. Um, and what is important, which I'm going to go through now, is um, who can be a victim. Okay. Victim is not the best word to use, but in this case, I'm going to use it. <clears throat> is, um, excuse me, is that you need to understand that people who can um, possibly allege um, harassment in the workplace are not just people employed at your workplace. Okay, so these people that are listed here um, can make a claim of harassment against an employee working for you or um, can be a perpetrator. So in essence, what that does is there's a much greater obligation to you as the employer to put policies in place to ensure that people are not, um, uh, you know, a victim of, of harassment. And remembering it's not just sexual harassment, it's bullying, it's emotional abuse, it's, you know, you know, cyber bullying, et cetera, et cetera. There are a number of things that you need to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition to protecting those against harassment, there is also an obligation for you as the employer to teach people how you expect them to behave. So is it acceptable to continue to ask someone out on a date if they say no, no, it's not. Is it acceptable um, at a work function, you know, when we've had a few drinks, is it acceptable to start groping and grabbing everyone? No, it's not. So you have an obligation to ensure that people understand one, what their rights are, and two, um, <clears throat> how they're expected to behave. So there's a much greater obligation. There's even a risk assessment that you need to do. If you do need to have um, the risk assessment, please email us. We can send you a risk assessment and a report, but there's a much greater space. And this falls under employment equity um, where you are required to do a lot more. I won't spend too much time on this. But just in terms of where employees, remembering the definition of employees that includes volunteers, et cetera, <clears throat> is that you need to understand that this is where people are protected. It includes work-related trips. So, uh, you know, there's a number of cases that have been at the CCMA where you've gone on a, I don't know, a conference after hours. Everybody thinks that everything is fine. Uh, we're all having a few drinks or some dinner or whatever. And then, um, or even social activities, Christmas parties are fantastic. There's always disciplinary hearings thereafter because now we're no longer at work. It's all fun and games. And so I behave badly. And then on Monday morning, I now need to face the consequences. So as an employer, you, you need to tell people how you expect them to behave. And then also is to tell those um, in the workplace that are possibly victims of harassment what it is, um, you know, what, what it is that they can do in order to be protected. So how do they report? Um, and I think for me, the main thing is just to let you know as the employer is that if you fail to do, to investigate harassment, you are then liable for the action of the person who harassed them. Okay, so if somebody makes a claim of harassment, often this will happen where people will go, oh, Bob's such a nice guy, he would never, ever, ever, ever do that. And so you, you know, Nikki, just, I'm sure it's fine. You know, I'm sure he never meant it. If you do that or you do nothing, 
Um, you know, Nikki can now go to CCMA and say, I reported this, nothing was done. I was not kept safe. Once I reported it, they made me continue working with Bob, wada, wada, wada. And so now I'm taking the company to CCMA for failing to uh, do the right thing. Doing the right thing doesn't necessarily mean that Bob is automatically guilty and needs to be fired, etc. It just means that you conducted an investigation, you did what you needed to do, and you did it properly. Okay, if you don't do that, then the company is then held liable for failing to take action. And remembering who, again, can be a victim, so it doesn't necessarily need to be somebody who works for you. If I come to your workplace to do training and one of your employees harasses me, I can then come to my employer, my employer goes to you. If you fail to do something, even though I don't work for you, I can then take my employer as well as you to CCMA and you are now held liable for that person's action if you didn't do the right thing. Okay. Alrighty, so um, that is a whole nother webinar all on its own, so I'm going to move past it, but it is quite important and a lot of people are not aware of the new code of good practice that actually came into effect in March 2022. So if you need more information, please, please send us an email. I can send you a risk uh, assessment. There's quite a lot of stuff that needs to be done and it does fall under employment equity, so it's not something completely different, but you do need to make sure that you get it done okay then moving on to the fourth element which i'm just going to go over very quickly is that you cannot do medical testing on employees um, for the purpose of excluding them from a promotion i don't know whatever it is unless legislation permits or requires the testing or it is justifiable to do so in light of employment conditions social policy etc cetera, etc cetera. so in other words you can't just randomly be doing medical testing if it has nothing to do with the job or anything for the purpose of excluding the person from something okay all righty <clears throat> okay there is one other element which i haven't actually included here it's not often dealt with but there is a fifth element of unfair discrimination which relates to psychometric testing now, um, you know, I don't believe that it's often a challenge one, but you can't do psychometric testing for the purpose of excluding or preferring someone if that psychometric testing doesn't meet the minimum standards, you know, which is it has to be, you know, there's three things that it has to do. Um, it's not often, so in other words, you can't just make up one and you can't just decide that you're going to exclude or prefer people based on that. Okay. Um, so, it is not unfair discrimination to take affirmative action measures consistent with the purpose of this Act or to distinguish, ex exclude or prefer any person on the basis of the inherent requirements of the job. So, two, two elements here. One is, is that if I have an employment equity plan and my plan says that I am going to prefer, for argument's sake, um, I don't know, let's just say African males because that is where I'm underrepresented, when I exclude other race groups in a recruitment process, or I have two people both equally qualified and I prefer the one over the other one, if it's in my employment equity plan that that was what I was going to do, then it is not unfair discrimination. If, however, I do not have an employment equity plan or it doesn't say that, I do need to be careful of, of, of picking one over the other on the basis of something that's listed in section 6.1. Uh, because that would be unfair. So you can't, for argument's sake, just throw away all CVs of a particular race group if you don't have anything in your employment equity plan, because that in itself is automatically unfair. You can't exclude or prefer someone based on what is listed in section, section 6.1 without having a good, fair or justifiable reason. Okay. So when we now look at all of those things, and I've whizzed through it, but, but those things are important when you now start to put together your employment equity plan. So understanding what it is that we're trying to do. For example, we can't just say we will now put a moratorium on employing, I don't know, you know, this group of people. We know because it was all in the media, we're not allowed to do that. Okay. So when you look at your employment equity plan and you look at your analysis, you need to take into account things like your EAP. You need to remember the unfair discrimination, the elements of the unfair discrimination, so that when you look at your plan, you can apply that logic to what it is that you're doing. Okay. All righty. So 
Um, every employer, as I said before, must take steps to promote the equal opportunity, but there are designated employers that need to comply with the elements that I'm going to talk about now. Okay. As I said before, if we look at the elements, um, not the elements, sorry, the designated employers, it still remains as it is. The legislation has not changed. So for those of you who maybe didn't pop in at the very beginning, the, the legislation has not changed. And so for this particular year, being 2024, this submission, if you are under 50 employees, but you have a turnover that exceeds uh, that in Schedule 4, you do need to submit. Um, just to reiterate, if anybody didn't log on initially, is that if, if you have become non-designated, i.e. you've got less than 50 employees, or your turnover has gone below uh, the turnover schedule and you have not applied for the registration, you do need to submit this year. Um, the deregistration deadline is the 31st of August, so it runs from 1st of April to 31st of August. If you have not deregistered, you do need to submit this year, otherwise they can still um, issue you with a fine for failing to submit. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so now I'm going to go through the various steps with you in terms of what is required. Now, I want to again be clear based on the, um, the, the road show. Uh, these things are quite important. So when you're looking at if they're going to come and do an audit, and like I said before, they are doing audits. Uh, please take notes in terms of what it is that they're looking for. So these steps that I'm talking to you about, firstly, they need to go in order. Okay, uh, they are not nice to do's, they are have to do's, and you need to have evidence that you have done these things. Okay, um, I'm also, when I go through, going to be telling you when they do audits, what it is that they're looking for. Okay, so this is what needs to be, this is what needs to happen for every single designated employer. So if you're over 50, or you have, or under 50, but have a turnover that is more than, or you just haven't deregistered, you need to have these things in place. Okay. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to, at the very minimum, have assigned a responsibility for um, the employment equity implementation to a senior manager. Okay. Now, there are very specific requirements. It is not just a, you know, Nikki, you're it. You do need to have it in writing. It has to be part of the key performance areas. There's very specific requirements when they do the audit. Um, and, and, and some inspectors require certain things or, or more things. So there does need to be a letter that is in, in writing. It has to be the person has to acknowledge it. So it's a letter that is given to Nikki and she acknowledges in the letter that she is now the uh, designated senior manager. Remembering that you can have more than one senior manager. So if you are a large organization, you can have more than one that is responsible, um, but you need to have it in a specific thing. So that letter must have specific requirements on it, and that must be put in the person's file and must be readily available if they do the audit. Also remember that if that person leaves, um, then you need to ensure that you appoint someone else. Okay. All right. Then what we need to do is remembering that this must be done in some kind in, in some order. So we're going to assume at this point that nobody has done anything. So if you have missed a couple of the steps, or if you haven't gone in this order, you maybe just need to have a look at you know things like dates. So. If you've done all your employment equity uh, reports and whatever, but you haven't done an employment equity senior manager, you need to do that, you know, like quite urgently. Okay, the second thing that we need to do, this is an ongoing thing, but if you haven't done employment equity, before we even get to the plan, you need to do this. Okay, so that is what we call communication, awareness, and training. Now, it does need to be ongoing. Um, when audits have come about where people have asked for evidence of this, um, they have said it must be ongoing. Some inspectors will say it must be at least once a year. Others haven't really asked about it. My suggestion is, is that what you do is you, if you do have teams, is that you have a channel in which, um, you know, people can access things about employment equity. Remembering that under here, this is possibly where harassment would fit in. So you do need to do um, 
training on what is discrimination, you know, diversity issues, what is employment equity. So people need to understand within the business, what, what are we actually doing? Okay, it must be ongoing, or you must have a channel in which information can be shared that people can have a look at and that they can see it. This isn't always asked in every single um, audit, but if it is asked, you need to have that information available. Okay, then we have what we call the EEA-1, which is the employee declaration. So as it stands at the moment, this is still required. Uh, there was talk that possibly it was going to be done away with, but it's not at this point. Um, and there have been many, many arguments regarding this form, okay, but as it stands in terms of the current legislation, based on what is required to be reported to Department of Labor, we have an employee declaration that we as employers must request that people complete, they can choose not to complete it. Okay, so when an employee starts, I give them the EEA-1, and on the EEA-1, it's a declaration that says that I um, am Nikki Hardwick, I am a either male or female, there are no other options, okay, it is either male or female, I can choose not to complete it, I'm either African, Indian, colored, or white, there are no other options, those are the four, I'm foreign national, or I'm South African, and I have a disability or I don't. I can then sign that form. And the purpose of the form is to ensure that I, as the employer, am <clears throat> submitting the correct information to Department of Labor. Okay. Like I said, there have been various arguments about, you know, changing the form and having, you know, gender neutral. Um, unfortunately, at this point, in terms of the reports that Department of Labor require, um, you know, the reason why we had employment equity with certain groups were, uh, you know, treated badly. Um, and, and we, you know, the, the form, the form is so that we can report. Okay. The only at this point is male and female, and we got the four different categories. Okay. If as an employee, <clears throat> excuse me, you do not wish to complete it, that is your choice and you can do that. But then what the employer does is I then just assume. Okay. Um, and I would do that any other time. So if a person doesn't, chooses not to complete the form, I then look at the employee and I then go, okay, I think that that person is a female and I believe her to be a white female. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've requested that you complete it and you've chosen not to do so. Okay. I mean, the, the employee can also change the form, okay, so if I can, and historically I think when the form originally came about, it was so that I could then say, yes, I'm now disabled, or no, I'm no longer disabled. Um, so in terms of the ability to change genders, um, people can do that, but you can have a policy that says that they can't do it more than once a year, otherwise it will affect your reporting. Um, but there is the ability to do that. But again, as I said, it's only male or female. Okay. Um, changing race groups, I would suggest, is not allowed um, purely because if I want to decide that I am a white male who now chooses to be an African female, I then, in terms of employment equity, because I'm now part of a designated group, would then get benefits that I wouldn't automatically get as a white male. Okay, so you can't change race groups, you are what you are, okay, according to, um, you know, what people can see. Okay, so in terms of that, you have those forms, in terms of poppy, okay, they are not allowed to be shared with the committee, they have to remain private, because I think you have your ID number, and it's got personal information, but you do need to have them available, should Department of Labor uh, request access to them, so that they can see that they have been done, okay. Alrighty, then you need to do an employment equity committee. Now, the committee cannot be three people, which includes the HR manager, the CEO, and the CFO. The purpose of the employment equity committee, uh, remembering that it's an advisory committee, but the purpose of the equity committee is to assist and guide management uh, to find things that are either discriminatory, to identify barriers to employment equity. And so the purpose is, and the way that I like to look at it, is to say, 
as a white female, I only have a perspective of being a white female. I can never know what it is like to be somebody else. Okay, another race group, another gender. And so when we're trying to establish why do we not have a particular group, I can only see things from my perspective. If somebody from that group, remembering also in terms of levels of employees, if I don't work on the shop floor, I don't necessarily know what is happening. The purpose of having someone from the shop floor in the committee meeting is when we're trying to identify why there is a particular barrier, that person comes with a perspective of <clears throat> what they see on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, and so the purpose of the committee is to bring different perspectives to try and identify where there are barriers to employment equity. They come with different viewpoints that I, as somebody in senior management, may not necessarily know. Um, the committee, like I said before, is an advisory committee. It is not another trade union. Um, it is not a work-based forum. The committee doesn't have the ability to... Um, they're now not involved in, in everything. They don't have decision-making powers. They are supposed to be there to advise and to identify and help the, the management and the senior management to keep on track and to help identify things that should be being done. Okay. They should be elected and not selected. Again, the point of the equity committee is to find people who will be able to bring a perspective. If I only pick people that I like, then possibly they will only be bringing my perspective. Now, the reason why it happens like this and the, 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 the committee is supposed to be representative and elective, elected, where it often goes wrong is that as soon as they're elected, it, it becomes another workplace forum or another uh, a different avenue for me as an employee to stand to, to stand and fight for my rights. The equity committee is not about the individual. It's not about Nikki coming with my viewpoint so that I can get um, you know better wages, less overtime. It's not about me. Okay, it's also not about the operational issues of the business. The equity committee, I've said it again, and I've said it and I'll say it again, is an advisory forum. They have no powers at this point. They are not responsible for um, the implementation of equity, because if they were, then they would also be responsible for fines that come about where the, the employment equity senior manager, if it all goes horribly wrong and there is now a fine and I need for it, then the equity manager, or at least the senior manager who's responsible, can be disciplined because they didn't do what they needed to do. The EE committee um, needs to be there, but they are not responsible. They can provide input, um, but they don't get to stand, stand there and inverted commas fight for rights. That is what a workplace forum is. That is what, um, you know, shop stewards, and that is what the trade unions, if you have one, that is what their job is. We are not taking that job. What the committee is also not is another avenue for me to bring my individual gripes to that meeting so they can be dealt with. If I have a grievance, that must then go to the line manager or to the HR person. The EE committee is not meant to be dealing with individual graphs. We look at the business as a whole. We identify, you know, where we're having problems. Um, for example, you know, when we're talking about grievances, if we notice in one particular department, I don't know, let's just say all the women continue to leave. When that is investigated by the people meant to investigate, i.e. HR, we find out that one particular manager is in fact, um, you know, harassing, I don't know, let's say all the women. And as the committee, what we do is we then say, well, then we need to do training. The manager needs to be dealt with. Um, but we don't, we're, we're not the people that go and do the investigation. We are now sitting as the equity committee saying something needs to be done. The managers need to go off or the HR person needs to go off and actually needs to, to deal with it. So we don't take the place of those things. We're not trained to be people in, for example, the recruitment and selection. We're not trained to decide who gets a promotion and who doesn't. So we don't take the place of that. Our job is to look at what is happening with equity and to make recommendations. So as an example, if we decide or we discover that we don't have a particular group of person and we then, because somebody has now said, well, the reason why we don't get people from that particular group is that there's a transport problem. 
Okay. As a committee, we could make various suggestions and we could say, well, what about a bus? What about a this? What about that? And then the management would decide whether or not from a financial perspective, can they then uh, look at that particular affirmative action measure. But management is ultimately responsible because if, it's, if, 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 if the plan is not accepted, if what they said they were going to do does not uh, meet the, the, the requirements of Department of Labor, it is management who then go to court and then have to justify those things. Okay. In terms of the Employment Equity Committee, what you to do when they do audits is you need to have a um, good set of employment equity committee meeting minutes okay there must be an attendance register people need to sign you mustn't be talking about things like the toolbox talks uh skills development um i don't know what are we doing on the public holiday next week these things that i'm talking about now are the things that you need to be discussing in the meetings Okay, so you need to be talking about, have we progressed? What has happened with the, I don't know, whatever it is that we spoke about. So there needs to be, <clears throat> excuse me, a set of minutes that when you submit it to Department of Labor, they can see that you're not talking about other things and that you're actually talking about employment equity issues. Okay. Um, the other thing as well with the, the committee is that you need to meet at least four times a year. If you have a plan that is expiring, you do need to have a set of minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, that deals with um, the, the development of the plan. So you need to have a set of minutes that speaks about what it is that you're going to be doing. Uh, it talks about the analysis. It, it deals with all of those things so that Department of Labor can see prior to us signing the plan off, the committee was spoken to. So you need to have that in a set of minutes it needs to be signed the committee needs to have signed that they attended or, or if they were absent obviously they, they wouldn't do it then but there needs to be something in writing that department of labor can look at it <clears throat> excuse me and go yes they met with the committee then they did the plan but it wasn't they did the plan and they didn't speak to the committee sorry one second okay if you haven't met with the committee and consulted with them on the development of the plan, then your plan will not be accepted by Department of Labor. Okay, so you need to meet with the committee, talk to them about the plan, um, and then do the plan. If you haven't done that and they do audit you, they're not going to accept your plan and they'll make you do it again. Okay, also if your committee is not representative of all stakeholders, again you're going to have a problem. So you need to ensure that when you look at your committee, that it is representative. Normally, what you look at is about 10% of your workplace, uh, up to about 15 people. I wouldn't have more than that. And when you look at everybody in your workplaces, you need to ensure that it is all levels, all race groups. Um, so you need to almost look at it scientifically when you look at this is what my workplace looks like, and therefore my, my committee is uh, representative. Okay, so it's a much more scientific approach than just picking four people. Okay, then once we've appointed our committee, we also should train the committee. It's ideal so that they know what they're doing. Um, but if you haven't trained them, that's fine. But I would suggest that you do. Uh, you must, before you do an employment equity plan, as you conduct a workplace analysis. So that is your EA12. If you have a plan and you did not do an analysis, your plan will not be accepted. You also need to ensure that your EEA 12, your snapshot, aligns to your EEA 13 snapshot. They're one and the same. Okay. Also remember, you know, when we look at the analysis, what we need to do is we need to do an analysis. <clears throat> so we do a snapshot. We identify where we over and under where our barriers are and then we meet with the committee often what will happen is people will do your ea12 snapshot for argument's sake on the 31st of august and my my new plan comes into play on the first of um september now <clears throat> i know you know from a logical perspective it's not possible for you to have done an analysis then consulted with the committee, then gone to management with all the committee's suggestions. Um, the, the management then go through the suggestions and then agree on the plan between the 31st of August and the 1st of September. Your analysis needs to be done prior 
and then you've got time to meet with your committee and then your plan comes into place. It can't be one day. It doesn't make any sense. They're not going to accept that because it's not logical that you would have been able to do that. So when you look at your workplace analysis, you need to do an assessment of a snapshot of what does my workforce look like. You need to identify where are their barriers to employment equity. So why do we have one group versus we don't have another group? My suggestion is, is that when we're looking at that, you do a couple of surveys, you speak to the committee as you start to, and that's where the training comes into comes into play so the committee understands what it is that they're doing and this is not just another workplace forum they understand what they're looking at they understand the numbers they they when they see the stats they understand what you're talking about so that they can give input that is relevant to the employment equity committee and they're not talking about overtime and i don't know you know other things that don't have any any value in employment equity committee Okay, you must use the format of the EEA 12. Um, you cannot use your own format, you must use your EEA 12. Okay, part of this analysis, which is now the new legislation, is you need to do a risk assessment on the workplace in relation to harassment. Okay, so this is part of the new, um, you know, what the new requirements. So you do need to do that. Um, I'm, I, I do need to tell you, though, that in the audits, they're not checking this at this point. Um, it is a recommendation, but if you're running out of time, you can park that till later. But it is part of employment equity. So at some point, I would suggest that you do that. And as I've mentioned before, if you would like access to that risk assessment with a, a report that comes afterwards, please feel free to, to, to email us and I can send you the link. Okay. Now that you've done your analysis, you've now met with your committee, they understand we've given input, we've done, you know, statistical overviews, et cetera, et cetera. We understand where we're over and under and why we, we've done all of those things. We then need to do our employment equity plan. Now, our plan must be anywhere between one and five years long. OK, and my suggestion is, is when you're doing a plan is try and do a little bit of a forecast. OK, so, you know, make it a little bit more scientific than just guessing what we're going to have in three years time is start to use things like retention and turnover um, ratios so that you can be a little bit more scientific about where do we think we're going to be in two years? Where do we think we're going to be in three years? Remembering that what. Department of Labor are going to do is they're going to hold you to that plan. And as we move into the new legislation, which is sector targets, is, you know, an employment equity plan should be something that you're actually looking at and going, this is what we think we're going to do in, I don't know, three years time. So they're going to hold you to it. If you have your employment equity plan that says, okay, this is what we think is going to happen. Here's our turnover. Here's our retention. We expect that we're going to lose X, Y, Z people. Uh, we'll gain X, Y, Z. If we gain those people, where are we going to focus? We're going to focus on these underrepresented groups, assuming they come available. If they then don't come available, you now have a plan for argument's sake that says this is what we're planning to do. You then have a look at recruitment numbers that you should ideally be looking at at least once a quarter to say, OK, are we on the right track? OK, we've now got four recruitment managers that when they're recruiting, they have no idea what they're looking for. So they don't know where we over and under. And that needs to be something that moves. It's not a plan because if you look at your plan at the beginning, there's a whole lot of changes that are going to happen. You need to be looking at numbers, possibly monthly, possibly quarterly, depending on your recruitment to go, when we're looking at that position, what should we be looking for? So people need to actively be looking at the numbers to go, all right, I need, I need, I don't know, at this particular uh, level, uh, my first prize would be this group. If I can't get one of one of those people, then I want one of those people. And so we go down in terms of a hierarchy of, let's call it importance, so that if we are questioned by Department of Labor as to why did we not do this, we can then say, well, that's why we didn't do it. We tried all of these things. Okay. Now, in terms of your employment equity plan, it does need to be in, in it must be taken from your EEA 12. You need to have evidence that you've consulted with your committee. Uh, your committee, as I said, must be properly constituted. So it can't just be your three best friends from work. Um, and you must have it in the EEA 13 format. Okay. You also need to make sure that your numbers make sense. 
Okay, so when you're looking at it, and, and, and the one thing that I do want to say is when we're looking at projections, you cannot say, because it is not accepted, that we don't expect to have any movements in the next year, because Department of Labor don't accept that. So when you're looking at a plan, <clears throat> you make certain assumptions. If this is going to happen, this is what I'm going to try and do. Okay, again, you also can't just say, well, we know in my industry, uh, we can't find X, Y, Z people, so we're not even going to do that. Although they're the most underrepresented, we're just not going to do that. Again, Department of Labor is not going to accept that. So if you have an overrepresented group, let's just say it's white females, we already have too many white females. We know it's a problem. So when we look at recruitment in the next year, we know that we're only going to get white females. So I'm going to project that we'll just get some more. They are not going to accept that. You cannot project that you're going to make the problem worse. So if you know turnover and retention, you possibly are going to lose two white females, let's just say. The recruitment of those two white females cannot be two more white females. You need to then try and make a plan to say we're going to get X, Y, Z, depending on which is the most underrepresented. Then take that information at your recruitment meetings and say, guys, if, if we find someone that is suitably qualified that meets these criteria, that must be your first prize. If we don't get that, then we can go the other, other route. But your plan needs to be an active thing that is working through the year that you need to go through. Then we get to the monitoring and evaluation. Sorry, I'm trying to say a whole lot of things in a very short space of time, but these are the kinds of things that the Department of Labor are looking for. So it needs to be an active thing that you're working with constantly. You need to have um, recruitment, um, I don't want to say schedules, but uh, something that you work with from a recruitment perspective that when people are looking at it, go, this is what we need to look at. Even promotion and training and all of those things, it needs to be an active living thing that you work with in your business. Okay, monitoring and evaluating mechanisms. Okay, this is quite important. So, you know, as you're going through, like I said, the recruitment uh, schedules, as you go through and you start to see, are we moving in the right direction? Oh, no, we're not. Why are we not moving? If you've got to do training and development on your, um, I'm using recruitment as an example, but if you've got to do training for them, then that's what you need to do. And so you keep a file of things if you uh, didn't meet your objectives or you've gone off target, why are we going off target? What has actually happened? Have we got have we have we lost 10 people? What 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 is happening? Okay. And then finally, which is the thing that everybody actually knows about is the submission of the reports on an annual basis, which is your EA2 <clears throat> and your EA4. The deadline is the 15th of January. Very clear from Department of Labor. If you don't meet the deadline or you know, there's no there's no coming back from that. We have from the 1st of September to the 15th of January. You cannot come on the 15th of January or the 16th of January and say, oh, sorry, I forgot. All oh, your system didn't work. They do not care. There are no penalties and interest. You have now failed. And in your failure to submit, you could be liable for a 1.5 million rand fine. My suggestion is, is get in early, get it submitted, and then you are done. Okay. So I whizzed through that super duper fast. Um, I, I do apologize for that. Um, we have reached the end of the presentation, but again, my takeaway from today for you guys is to know that if you're just using employment equity as a box ticking exercise, you, you, you're going to fall short. My suggestion is, is that what you do is um, if it cannot be done internally, then you find someone, you know, we're able to assist you, but you find someone that understands employment equity. It is not just about employing people of a certain race or gender or whatever, but is actively seeing where we where are we short? Can we fix it? And if we can't fix it, what is the issue? But you need to start making it an active part of your business so that if you are audited, that you have something that you can justify and you can argue. You need to make sure that your minutes are up to date. You need to make sure that you're actively um, discussing this with the committee. And I think a key takeaway as well in terms of the committee is the committee need to understand what their role is because there is a lot of confusion from a committee perspective 
um, you know, what are they supposed to do? It's just a skills meeting that you, you know, put a little bit of equity onto it, or it's a toolbox talk that you kind of deal with equity. Your, your equity meetings need to be about employment equity, and they also need to understand that it is not another operational meeting or a workplace forum in which I can come and fight for my own individual rights. As soon as your committee begins to understand that, they are then able to actively assist you in, you know, doing the right kinds of things. Okay. So, guys, that brings us to the end of our session today. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to email. Um, and if you want to see the uh, risk assessment, you can email us as well. Uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed the session, um, and we will see you soon. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your week.